I cannot wait tonight for us to uh, embark upon what I hope will be a uh, will be a game changing moment in your life because we're dealing with what I believe to be the greatest mission on earth. We're going to talk tonight about how to how to apply the principles you've learned in this seminar at the congregational level. So you individually, collectively through the church can immediately start reaching out to lost souls in your area. So this is the, this is the tip of the iceberg when it, comes to, when it comes to evangelism. There are a lot more principles you have to learn, but this right here is going to be the application part of it. And I want to, uh, I'm excited about tonight because this, is, this, this gives you direction. It gives you, uh, it gives you something to do. It's an actionable lesson. And so we're grateful for your participation. Now, how many of you this morning received Reaching the Lost in your email? How many got it this morning? All right. So if you signed up during this seminar, you would have received it. If you did not receive it, you need to make sure that as my son goes up and down the, the pews, that you put your name and address, your email address on that piece of paper because you need to get Reaching the Lost. Reaching the Lost is our accountability. It's our, it's our reporting mechanism. It's our training mechanism. We send it out every... Every Wednesday morning, it comes out about seven o'clock, except when we're in Honolulu, and um, and it uh, it will it will give a report on the churches enrolled in our school. Remember, you are in a school, and when you're in a school, there is accountability. So for one solid year, we're going to start feeding you our curriculum, and it's a step by step process. So those principles you've learned can be applied, and you can begin step one. Here's what we need to do. Step two. Here's the second step we need to take. And so when you wonder, you know, how does a church like um, the River Bend Church of Christ in Georgia baptize 19 people in four months? That's how they do it. How does the Woodstock Church of Christ baptize 17 people in three months? That's how they do it. How does a little bitty church like New Hope right outside Freed Harbin has 35 people, baptized five people in the last two months? That's how they do it. These churches accomplish these actionable uh, uh, results because they follow the process. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not enough for me just to show up and preach a bunch of principles. The principles are true, but if you don't act on them, if you don't know what to do with them, it's not going to produce results. And we're a result-oriented people. Brother, we, we serve in a, a result-oriented God, a God that wants results. He wants to see, you know, Christianity in action. It's more than sitting in a pew. It's more than attending a, a Wednesday night service. This is not a gospel meeting. I say, I say that in every seminar, I am not here to preach, you know, five lessons, fire up the, the brethren, because I know when I leave, it's like a July 4th fireworks show, it'd dissipate as, as fast as it went up. So that excitement loses, you lose that hot air real quickly. So we've got to immediately put this into action. So what I want to do tonight in this lesson is give you something actionable. And then we're going to take these action principles, these action statements, and I'm going to meet with your elders on Sunday when we do the advanced sessions. I've got three advanced sessions to give you Sunday. And I'm going to sit with your elders around 3, 3.30 with Lima, maybe a few other men, and we're going to start putting this together. We're going to put it in gear. And I call that lesson, let's make it operational. Because a plan is nothing if it's not made operational. You know, the military has got a lot of plans. But those plans don't mean a lot until they become operational. So we're going to give you a plan tonight, but it doesn't mean anything if you don't put it in gear, if you don't take that plan. And so we, we got a model that we've been working on for years. It's really just every month. It seems to be uh, uh, it seems really to be um, working better and better. And we're going to share that with your leadership and with Lima. And so this is a this is an exciting this is an exciting time to be here. So make sure you sign up reaching the lost. That's your accountability. Honolulu was in there this morning. Did you see it? Did you see Honolulu in there? It's had a big picture. Welcome to the Honolulu Church of Christ to the School of Evangelism. So for one solid year, I'll be getting reports from Lima. And um, he'll be saying, hey, Rob, we've done step one. All right, you got 49 more steps to take. And uh, step one is great. And you got to start with step one, but there's a lot more to do than step one. And if you'll follow that process, God will bless you because this is, a, this is incredible what we're witnessing and what we're seeing in these churches. Um, 200 and I think we passed 270 baptisms this year in the churches so far where we've trained them and it's exciting. And uh, there's if, if 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 evangelism doesn't put a fire in your soul, you're already in the coffin. This is the most exciting thing on earth. So tonight we're gonna we're gonna hope a lot of fire in you. So the war was going poorly, and Chamberlain had made a mess of the war effort in Great Britain. And um, 
And so, um, well, before I get started, that is the wrong lesson, brother. That is the wrong. Lima, can you get that lesson I sent you? Um, I think I sent that, uh, sent that lesson. You get that fired up for me, and I'll just keep going. So the war was going poorly, and um, it was, uh, Germany was making advances. They, they, they'd almost taken the entire country of France. Winston Churchill looked at his country. The morale was at the lowest point. The, the people were uh, defeated. You could tell the attitude of the people, you know, was just d- depleted. And Chamberlain was a compromiser. He was an appeaser. And he, he was even thinking of coming to terms with peace with Hitler, which would have been an outright disaster for world history. And Winston Churchill knew he had one shot at this. He's going to go before the commons, that is the parliament, and he's going to make a speech. And he's got to stir, he's got to stir the assemblymen, he's got to stir the country, and he's got to get the backing of the people. And he realizes if he doesn't get the backing of his party, the backing of the people, that Chamberlain was going to continue down his course, which would be a, a course of, of, of great loss. So he, he walks into the commons, he makes this great and rousing speech. It's one of the great speeches in, in, in the history of, 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 of nations. And in that speech, he said something that rings loud and clear. He who fails to plan is planning to fail. He says, countrymen, we have no plan. Brethren, what I see in churches of Christ right now is we have no plan. Most churches are shooting from the hip. Their, 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 their doors are open. They're friendly. They're kind people. They, they, it's, not, it's not as though they don't love the Lord. But when it comes to an organized plan to reach lost people in their community, there isn't one. We have, now, don't worry. We have a plan to reach Jamaica. And we have boards that meet. We have committees that meet. We have elders that come together. We got plans to go to New Zealand, Scotland. You name the country, we got a plan. We've got plans in Tanzania. We got schools, widows, homes. We're all in. And when it comes to writing the check to go overseas, we don't even blink an eye. We write the check. We're ready to go to Samoa. I'm talking about the plan to reach the people that live around your church building. I'm talking about the plan to reach your next door neighbor. I'm talking about the plan that you need to reach the people that you work with, you go to school with, you play ball with, you see them every single day. I want to know about that plan. What is it? Well, unless uh, unless you're just very unique, most of us don't have one. We don't have an organized plan. In fact, if if you were to go to your place of employment, the place where you make a living, and and if you were to if you were to apply the same plan you've got for local church growth to your business, you'd go bankrupt. You wouldn't make it. And what I want to do is I want, I want to dig down deep because I'm looking at a very talented group of men. I'm looking at men who've been successful in their life, men who've, who've been able to raise families. Some of you have raised even grandchildren, and, you, and you've been able to plan and, and, and save, and, and you've been able to, even in tough times, you've been able to squeeze out and, and make ends meet. These are men, you work hard, you get up, you get up in the morning, you, you spare no expense, you, you take care of your family, you, you give anything to help your children grow up and be successful. I want that same energy, that same planning to be put into saving people's souls. And by and large, we're not doing that. So what I'm going to give you is 10 things you've got to do. Now, it's not operational in this lesson. This is a planning lesson. You know, a coach comes down into the locker room. He puts the whiteboard on there. He puts X's and O's on there. He tells the football team, you know, memorize your spot. No, this is plan A, plan B, plan C. This is what we're going to do in this situation. You know, and all that's great. Until the whistle blows. I've done some coaching in my life, and I know when the whistle blows, those X's and O's don't mean a lot. Because you look at your team and you're like, Did you not didn't you not remember the, the whiteboard and the X's and O's? I don't know how many times I looked at my basketball team, the high school basketball team, and I said, Did you not remember what we just did in the in the locker room? That doesn't look like anything I wrote on the board. X's and O's don't mean anything till the whistle blows. Brother, I'll give you the X's and O's in this lesson, but they don't mean anything unless you blow the whistle. And then we got to make it operation. It doesn't always look pretty at first. Got to make adjustments. We'll make them. Your elders have to be completely, completely on target. I mean, they have to be glued in. The, 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 it, it's it's, it's going to be work. I, I, I want to admit to you, Brother Ralph, Brother Rim, Brother Pat, this is going to take work. It's going to be the greatest work you've ever done in your life. It'll be the most rewarding thing you men have ever done. You're going to see your members smile unlike they have ever smiled before because they will know they've got a job to do and they're going to do it. I don't know if if you're an elder tonight or in leadership tonight, I don't know if you realize how much power or authority God has given you. It's incredible. But most of our leadership don't use it. 
You know, our, our members wait. They're waiting for you to tell them what to do. They just don't know what to do. And, and so this is going to give you that starting point. Here's what you need to do. And you've got to tap them on the shoulders. And you've got to say, this is your job. This is what you do. In, in this church, this is, we need you to work in this area. This is your, and this is how you do it. That's how specific it's got to be. It's that specific at your place of employment. If, you, if your boss didn't do that, if your workplace didn't do that, you wouldn't have a job. Your, 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 your company would go belly up. So we have in the church, we gotta start, a, we've got to start training members, training them how to do the job, assigning them that job, and then collectively working together to save souls. There was a book put out in the 1970s um, called Go Me Means Go Ye. Y'all remember that book? I'm going to challenge your thought process on that book. I love the book. It's full of great principles. I highly recommend you read it. Go ye does not mean go me. Rather than go ye means go all. And if we're going to sign out evangelism to two or three people in the church and think we're going to grow, you're sadly. The only way the church grows is go ye means go all. Every member of the church of Christ must get involved. We are an army of soul winners. We are not a social club. Our goal and our mission has got to be revolving around that mission, and we have got to begin to train our members. Now, listen, I, I don't expect every member to lead a Bible study. I, I've been saying that all week. I think you need to know how. I think you need to know one. But I, I'm, I'm, I understand that may not be your wheelhouse. That's all right, because there are men and, and even ladies that, that, that they enjoy sitting down with, with, with others and couples and individuals, and they enjoy it, and they're good at it. Do you know evangelism is a lot more than taking back to the Bible and doing a study? It's a lot more than that. There's a lot of pieces to it. So what's the first thing you got to do? Well, you got to learn how to do it. You're going to have to have the equipment. You don't have the equipment, it's not going to work. Can you advance the slide for me, brother? If you do not have the equipment, you're not going to be able to do a Bible study. So at the very basic level, you have Bibles. You know, I, I've done mission work all of my life, and one of the things we always do is pack up Bibles. You know what I found in a lot of churches? Our churches are not prepared to do Bible studies because we do not have Bibles to do Bible studies. Most of us don't have pew Bibles anymore. And if we do have pew Bibles, they're, 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 you can't read them. The font is so small. Somewhere in this church building needs to be Bibles that we can use for Bible studies. I'm talking about Bibles that are large print, giant print. we got to have the resources to do the study. Because what I'm finding out today especially is there are a lot of folks out there that don't even have a Bible. So you're going to show up to do a Bible study, and, and, and I can tell you that you will save yourself a lot of heartache if you'll just give them a gift and give them a Bible. They're probably going to use the Bible you give them, which will solve a lot of other problems. So one of the first things you need to do is have Bibles. I find a lot of churches are not prepared for Bible studies. They don't even have a Bible to give out to do that. Then we've got to find out a method. we got to have a method. we got to have something, a tool in our hand. Now, again, we're, we're looking at a, a culturally uh, significant moment in history which means that things are shifting and shifting quickly. And there's a growing group of people in our nation who are not, they're not ready for back to the Bible. They don't even believe in God. So we got to use something else. It needs to be organized. You can't shoot from the hip. It needs to be as organized as open Bible study, back to the Bible, whatever it is you use, it needs to be very organized. And it also needs to have a track record of success. So I would suggest believe the Bible. I, I, we took 10 years to develop that. Through the Apologetics Center, Bart Bourne, Apologetics Press. We went, we went everywhere. We went to our schools of preaching. We said, teach this, train, tell me, test it. We went to churches and said, try it out. Tell me if it works. Believe the Bible is a tool. I've talked about it this week. It's a tool. Three lessons, just like back to the Bible. Lesson A, the affirmation of God. Lesson B, believe the Bible. Lesson C, Christ, who is he? You've got to have a tool. So when someone says, I don't even know that Jesus was real. Well, back to the Bible is not where you need to start. All right, you need to pull out another lure or you're not going to be successful. Then we need to have studies for those who are religiously minded. They already believe in God and the Bible. Maybe there's somebody sitting in your pew and they've been in your pew for six, seven, eight months, maybe five years. They've never obeyed the gospel. Doesn't matter. One, they just need one study. It's incredibly effective. And so does it matter is for people maybe who do not need extended study. Maybe they already have the, they just need help across the finish line. Well, then, well, then we got back to the Bible. We got back to the back to the Bible as a three lesson booklet set that is it talks about number one, the authority of Christ. Number two, it's going to talk about the church of Christ. Number three, it's going to talk about the salvation of Christ. Brethren, I do not baptize people who do not understand the church of Christ. If you do not understand the church of Christ, we need to get back and do a Bible study on the Lord's church. Philip did it. Acts eight, verse 12. 
before he baptized them. He talked about the kingdom of God. We don't baptize people who do not understand what the church is. You're baptized into the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. How in the world can we baptize people if they don't even know what they're being baptized into? They must understand that. You don't skip the church. One of the reasons we have people baptizing people and you never see them again. Well, we baptized five people. We hadn't seen them once on Sunday morning. Did you ever study about the church? Of Christ? Well, we were going to do that later. I suggest you do it first. I suggest we, that's one of the first things we talk about. Let's talk about the church of Christ because Philip did it. And if he's inspired and it was good enough for Philip, it's good enough for me. Just look at the order, Acts 8, 12. That's why back to the Bible was written like it is. Bobby Bates was asked, why did you write back to the Bible like that? He said, I just followed Philip's recipe. I talked about the name of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God, and baptism. I'm going to suggest you're going to have a hard time beating that one. I'm not inspired. So now, now that we've got the tools, we've got to get materials for bringing people, teaching people, new converts. We've got, to, we've got to get materials to reach our communities. You've got to get the tools. What I find is very interesting in churches of Christ. We have everything we need to have our morning coffee. I bet you got coffee pot, coffee filter, coffee cups, coffee creamer, coffee stir. I bet you got the coffee maker and coffee grind, don't you? Oh, we'll prepare. We got everything we need to open a soup kitchen. We got ovens, microwaves, refrigerators, and freezers. We got salt and pepper, spoons, forks, paper cups, paper plates. We got we got uh, napkins. We got tablecloths. We got good tables. We got we got everything we need to feed the church. I want to know where the tools are to reach lost people. Well, we're going to call we're going to call gospel advocate. Why don't we make sure we have them at the local church? Well, you know, we have everything we need to. We have everything we need to outfit our Bible classes. We could probably open a school. We have laminators and crayons and markers and pencils and map pencils and scissors and safety scissors. And then we have glue sticks and safety glue. We don't want the children getting sick. And we got we got other types of glue. And we got various postcards and poster board and colored paper, astrobot paper, coffee machines. And we got, I want to know where the evangelism material is. Number two, let's get it out there where people can get to it. Let's put it out there where the brethren can actually use it. Let's not hide it in the preacher's office. Let's not put it in a library. But no one ever enters and no one knows what's in there. Let's put it out there where people can get it. I suggest you immediately create an evangelism table at your church. It's not hard to do. You get the materials. You put the table out there and you say, this is our evangelism center. And we've got these all over the, the brotherhood right now. People are putting out the materials. Say, here they are. This is what we use for, for evangelism. One preacher told me several years ago, he said, Rob, he said, I was so excited after you said that. He said, man, he said, he said, I got my stuff. I set it up. You know, I put the table out there and I ordered my tablecloth. And um, hey, man, Rob, I came back two days later and the, he said, Rob, it was gone. His name's David. I won't give you his last name. And I said, well, David, I said, maybe that's good. The brethren were hungry. They wanted all of it. He said, oh, no, Rob. <laughs> he said, no. He said, Rob, you're so optimistic. <laughs> He said, Rob, I came back. To, I put it up again. I, I had more material. I put it out there, you know, just like I was supposed to. And I, I showed up two days later. It was gone. I called one of the elders. I said, where's our evangelism material? I said, now, David, when we built this $2 million facility, you remember that we had a planning meeting on what goes in the foyer. Now, David, that was not on the approved list. David, we, one of the ladies complained, and they were right. That's not an approved item, so we moved it so there wouldn't be any complaints, and we put it in the coat closet. He said, let me understand correctly. You put all the evangelism materials in our coat. It's a big coat closet, David. Yeah, I know. He said, well, I, I didn't uh, I'll be my elder, so I got in the pulpit that Sunday night, and I preached that lesson that Rob suggests about evangelism tools, and I, I preached on the evangelism tools in the coat closet. Go get them. When you exit this building, go to the coat closet, pick them up, go evangelize, do it now. He said, I walked down the aisle, I stood by the coat closet, and I was waiting. I waited for them to come. Rob, do you know how many of the 200 people there that night went to the coat closet to get the materials? Guess how many? Zero. Brethren, in the church of Christ, if we cannot put evangelism materials where the brethren can get them, where people can see it, if we can't put it in our foyers, I have a suggestion for all of us tonight. Sell your church building and just go home. Brethren, this is the church. We are at the Lions Club. Our purpose, our, the reason we exist is to help reach lost people. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. His mission better become our mission. 
or we're becoming more of a fraternity or social club than we are an army of soul winners. Get your materials out there where the brethren can get them. Number three, there's a third step you got to take. You got to train people. Do you ever get any training at work, Dre? You ever go to work in your life? Have you ever been trained at work to do anything? I bet you have. How many of you have actually taken trips out of town to get training? Raise your hand, men. How many of you have taken trips out of your own state to get training? Raise your hand. How many of you have taken trips out of your country to get training? You know, when you work for Nissan, they're not going to train you in Alabama. You know where you're going? Japan. You know why? Because you're going to learn their way to do it. You work for us. Well, I got my way. Well, you can go work somewhere else if you got your way. See, when you work for me, you're going to do it my way, and, 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 or it's the highway. And so there's training. I train people. They don't automatically know. No, even the most basic of, of let, like, I don't know how to work, use a, um, uh, a hand cart. You know, you jack it up, where, how, to, how to put it into the pallet, where to pull it, and how to pull, push. Where, where. Yeah, and the most basic of lessons, you get trained. We don't just throw you out there and say sink or swim, hope you make it. Not unless you want a lawsuit. Not unless you want to wreck something, destroy something. Let me ask you this question. When is the last time you attended a church of Christ? I'm not talking about Monday night for the masters when we train five people how to do it. I want to know when is the last time as a congregation, the preacher got in the pulpit and said, we're going to learn how to do Bible studies. And he trained the entire church how to do it. It's novel, isn't it? I was raised in the Lord's church and that never happened. I can't remember one time. If it wasn't for one brother, Wade Brown, who set me aside and said, Rob, I'll teach you how to do a Bible study. I wouldn't have known how to do it. I mean, I sit and I, I'm, I don't want to name names, but I had one of the most capable, well-known preachers. I grew up under, and he's a good man. He taught me a lot. I love him. But I did not know how to do a Bible study. Why aren't we training our church members how to do this? If you're going to give them a tool, train them how to use it. Train them how to use, believe the Bible, and they might use it. Train them how to use, doesn't matter, and they actually might do something. Train them how to use, back to the Bible, and they actually, you might have, like Cliff Goodwin came up and said, Rob, it's amazing what's happened in Ironic. And I said, what's going on? He said, Rob, we're baptizing people like we've never baptized before. I said, well, Cliff, that doesn't surprise me. You're Cliff Goodwin. <laughs> and he said, I'm not doing it. You know, the best baptisms you'll have in Honolulu will be the ones that Lima does not do. I tell you what, it warms the heart of a preacher when the widows of the church go out to their neighbor and do a Bible study and call you and say, I need you to help me with a baptism because I've never done one before. When you actually teach your church members how to do Bible studies, they actually might do it. And so that, that we have to train people. Now, number four. Now, I'm going to put all this into action by the way Sunday. I'm just laying it out. This is the X's and O's time. Number four, here it is. We're going to promote an atmosphere of evangelism in our church. Which means that we've got to create an evangelistic map where everything, everything draws right back to saving souls. And someone says, Rob, does that mean you want to cancel our graduation banquet? No, nope. I just want to make sure that we take advantage of the sinners that come to the graduation banquet. And we have some evangelistic emphasis to it. Rob, does that mean you want to shut down our trick or trunk? No, nope. I want you to do it. And I want you to do it in such a way you've never done it before. We're going to create contacts and prospect people during our trunk or treat. We're going to promote evangelism in everything we do. Let me give you a quick example of what that looks like. Hello? Yes, my name is Lima. I'm the preacher here at Honolulu. Yes, we help people. Yes, we'd be glad to help you. What is your need? Well, do you pay, uh, do you pay light bills? Oh, yes, we, we love to help people with light bills. Just stay with me, elder, stay with me. Um, do, do you pay car payments? Oh, yes, we, we, we help people with car. Do you, do you help with food? Yes, we help with food. Do you, do, you help, do, you, do you help move people? Oh, yes, we help. Do you help with gas? I'm running. Yes, we help. I, I never say no. I have one mission. Well, where, where, where is this church located? When can we get this kind of help? We offer this help every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock, and we can't wait to see you. I, I don't know if I can be there. Not, so that's okay because we're going to send someone to pick you up. I, I don't know. If, I, I'll probably be busy on Sunday. Well, that's okay because Sunday night at 6 o'clock, we'll, we'll pick you up too. Well, I, I'll be busy all Sunday. I'm sure you will. Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, we'll come get you then. Now, eventually, they're going to run out of excuses. And you're going to show up at their door, and you're going to pick them up. Now, this is novel. I know this is out of the box, but it works. That's how we baptized 17 people at Jacksonville last year. We did that by doing this right here. This is one of the ways we did it. 
people will call us. We say, we'll show up and we'll pick you up. I don't have a car. No problem. We've got 20 men out there. How many of you would go pick somebody up if they needed to come to church? Anybody? All right, we're going to pick you up. So we're going to pick you up, bring it. Now, when they walk in the church building, guess what we're going to do, Lima? Uh-oh, this is novel. This is going to frighten the brethren. We're actually going to take that, that visitor into a Bible class. Husband and wife will do it together, and we're going to do a Bible study with them. Ooh. Preacher, can you do a Bible study during Bible class? I said, hope so. And so we're going to take them into a I – mean, we're not going to have them in the adult class? No, we're not going to feed a steak to an infant. We're going to take them to a room. We're going to open up Believe the Bible or Back to the Bible, and we're actually going to do a Bible study with people who come and need help. Brethren, it's not that difficult. You will baptize people like that. What they're not going to do is sit in that adult class, and they're going to understand almost nothing you say because they're not, they, don't, they don't even have a foundation to understand it. But you give me, time, give, give me 45 minutes one-on-one, and let's, let's see how much they'll learn. It's exciting. And uh, now, after that little Bible study, we're going to, hey, what was it you needed again? I needed some help on my light bill. <laughs> how many of you are willing? Now, I tell you, I don't know, maybe Honolulu's unique. But in Alabama, there's a lot of charlatans. And they go from church to church trying to take money from everybody. You know, we get burned. and We don't like to help them because we know they're probably just, you know, and we, we come up with every reason under the sun not to help them. It's kind of like the albatross around the neck, you know. We don't. <laughs> And I, I remember at Willette, this is early on in my preaching, I got so many benevolent calls, I asked the elders to put in a second line. They said, why? I said, give me a private line, only the members know it. And, and so they kept ringing this other line, and so I put an answering machine on it because I didn't want to answer it because I knew if I answered it, I would have to do, have some benevolent call, which would be, I didn't know what to do with it. And so I stopped answering. What a terrible idea that was. That was awful. That was a terrible strategy. I should answer it every time. Contact calling. I need to get him to the church building. We need to do Bible studies. And, um, and I look at it and say, oh, by the way, uh, how many of us would be willing to help somebody that did a Bible study? Now, I may not pay off their house, but I might, you know, you need a little food? We've got some back there. Normally, a person that's willing to do a Bible study is not a charlatan, or if they were, they're not anymore. Maybe everybody that followed Jesus was... Uh, Genuine, I doubt it. You know, Jesus says something very interesting about benevolence. He said, the poor will always be with you. You know, it's sad to know that some churches think their evangelistic ministry is feeding the poor. They become a soup kitchen in the local community. And I asked them this question, how many souls have you saved? Not one. Brethren, you will not solve world poverty at Honolulu. But what you can do is do what Jesus did. You can use your goodwill, your kindness to open the hearts so that you can do a Bible study. If you're going to help feed the poor but not do Bible studies, you are nothing more than a soup kitchen. And that is not biblical. That is not the intent of Christ. What Jesus wants you to do is help people, yes, but teach them the word of God. That's an evangelistic atmosphere. Now, I'm not, well, I've got a lot on this slide. I don't have time. Let's go to, well, do those look familiar, by the way? I don't know if they look familiar in Honolulu, but in the States, oh, yes, we got backpack drive, teacher supply giveaway, turkey giveaway, blessing boxes, vouchers, winter coat, not in Alabama, winter coat drives, and not in Honolulu, but in the north. And then and we've got the benevolent building. How many baptisms? Well, we've been doing it for 10 years, or we're getting close to one. Shut it down until you can figure out how to turn those into Bible studies. Her name's Kim. She called the building. And uh, she said, hey, uh, Deb Rice answered at house to house. And she calls me and she said, hey, Rob, she says, I got a contact. And she, uh, she says she needs help. And now, Rob, I told her that we would come pick her up for church. And she said she'd come. I said, great. I said, we'll pick her up. And we picked her up. And Kim's living in the uh, government housing. And uh, we pick her up and take her over to the church. And she's telling us about how she came here with almost nothing, you know, in her bank. And, and she's got these back problems and all these health problems. And her family's abandoned her. And. And we're, you know, we're just listening. It's principle number seven. I taught you in the seminar, hearken, or six, hearken, listen to them. Don't say anything. Just listen. Be sympathetic. And so I, Kim's going through her own spiel. She sits through the lesson. You know, that was a good, good lesson. Enjoy me. Kim, uh, were you needing something? Yeah, I need a little grocery. I said, let's go down here to the DG. Now, I know y'all don't have a DG, but you got a Walmart. And so we took him to the DG and, um, you know, got her some canned goods and bread and things. And, 
Rob, I still remember it. Rob, um, you know, my, my bathroom, my shower is slippery and I fell, hurt my back. Can I get one of those rubber mats? Go get your mat, Kim. So we got our mat. I said, Kim, I'll help you put it in your bathtub. Sure. That'd be, I walked in that house and that thing was mold infested. Kim, um, have you been sick since you've moved in here? Yep, can't get over this. You know, I'm always, Kim, you got mold problems. It's all, it's all flaws. And I said, uh, Kim, I said, this is unacceptable. I said, uh, I said, we'll make a few phone calls and get this straightened out. And we did. And they, they had a brand new place waiting. Just so happened to be ready to go. And it's amazing what happens when you, when you talk about mold to the government. And, um, and so in any case, uh, I, Kim says, well, I can't move, Rob. I, 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 I don't know how to, I, I said, Kim, we got, we got men standing by. Anybody ready to help move somebody? men were we, we uh dale harris and sherry harris and us and the webster we all pulled in you know whoever jared pulled in and we're all loading up things you know and putting in our, our vehicles and and then we 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 move her on over you know we set up we have to reset up the bed set up everything and i'm sitting there jared and i family we're sitting there talking to kim kim i got a question for you these are my one-liners you might want to memorize them because they pay dividends i use the same one-liners every time kim yes rob i said hey uh what do you think about the Jacksonville Church of Christ? Wow, man, it's a nice church. I already knew that. I never ask a question I don't know the answer to. I always know the answers before I ask. I'm going someplace. Kim, what do you think about the Jacksonville Church? I didn't ask her that when she visited the first time. She's not ready. I prospected her first. I want to prospect before I ask this question. Kim, what do you think about the Jacksonville Church? Oh, I like it. Nice church. I, very healthy. You guys have been gone out of your way. I, right. Kim, would you like to know more about us? No, don't want to know anything about y'all. What do you think she said? She, oh, I'd like to know a whole lot more about y'all. Yes, I, I just so happen to have these little books. I always have the booklets because I have one mission. I'm going to do a Bible study. I'm not going to talk her into the church. I'm not going to coax her into the church. I'm not going to bribe her into the church. I'm going to study with her. Psalm 19.7 says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. That's what this book is for. And so we're going to study with her. And we did. Guess what she did? Guess where she is every Sunday? Number five, this is the most important step in the process. Take your Bibles. I'm gonna, I wasn't planning to do this tonight, so you, you have to bear with me. I think we're going to start Matthew 14. I wasn't planning on this, but you've motivated me. So Matthew 14. I love to be here. Matthew 14. I think that's where I want to be. And um, let's go here to Matthew chapter 14. Let's notice, let's notice just a few things here. I may be in the wrong place. Matthew 9. I think I'm in Matthew. Yeah, there I am. Matthew 9. I said, you have to bear with me. Let's go to Matthew 9. And let's just notice a few verses together. Because this right here, this is it. This, this step right here. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is it. This is the, this, you've got to get this down. This is, you're going to do this for the rest of your life. The focus of the church is going to be right here. This is number five. Let's go to Matthew 9 and verse number 2. And behold, they brought. You know Christianity is a brought religion. You bring people. We need bringers. We need people that bring people. It's a, it's a taught religion. It's a brought religion. It's not a bought religion. It's a brought religion. We are bringers. we got to bring people. And all, when you read the accounts of the gospel, you always, they're the bringers. They're, you're bringing people. we got to find them. All right, let's, let's go down here just a little bit more. Let's go down here to verse 13. But go ye and learn what this meaneth. I have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call. It's also a calling religion. Now circle that word call there in verse number 13. Um, and I'm working on a lesson. I'm going to put this in our advanced series uh, this year. So this is a little raw. So um, bear with me. But look at that word call and just circle it. Christianity is a called it's a calling religion. We call people. We call them through the gospel. It's not something better felt than told. It's not a vision or a dream. It's not a big spirit in the sky. No, it's a calling religion. We call people by the gospel of Jesus Christ, 1 Thessalonians 2. So let's look at this again. So verse 13. Now let's go down. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's go down to verse number 37. Let's go down to verse 37. So it's a calling religion. You bring people. We need bringers. We got, go down to verse 37. Then saith he to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are... Do you believe the harvest is plentiful in Honolulu? Do you believe that? If you don't believe that, you don't believe the Lord. Do you think the harvest is plentiful in Alabama? Do you think it's plentiful in Illinois? Oh, it's, it's really plentiful in Chicago. It's, a, it's plentiful everywhere. 
It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's plentiful everywhere. So, so we, 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 don't have a, we don't have a plentiful problem. So it's not that, well, I just don't know who I'm going to teach. You're not looking. They're everywhere. Now, let's see if we can take this concept and do something with it. Go to 2237. Go to 2237. Well, when a preacher gets off script, you never know where he's going to go. And so I think that's where I'm going here. So Matthew chapter 9, and I want to go to 2214. So I'm going to introduce a concept, and I'm going to develop this in the elders meeting on Sunday. This is, a, this is powerful, brethren. And I, I, I don't know why, how I missed it for so long. But I want you to go um, up to, go, start with verse 9. Go ye therefore, verse, chapter 22, verse 9. Go ye therefore to the highways, and as many, circle the word many. Circle that word. Now watch what Jesus does. It's very interesting. I, I didn't catch this until recently. As many as ye shall find, bid them to the marriage. So go get them. We need, how many do we need? How many, gentlemen? What's the word? Many. How many are you calling at your church? How many are being called at your church, in your community? I had a preacher call me. He said, Rob, uh, we did the seminar last fall. I said, yes, it's not working. It's like we thought. I said, all right, let me get my troubleshooting list. I actually have a troubleshooting list. And I brought my troubleshooting list out. And I said, let's start with step one. How many contacts you have on your list? Well, he didn't have a list. And I said, well, that's, that's another problem. But how many you got? He said, we've got two. That's not many. Well, what do you mean? I said, that's not many. I said, Jesus said, many. So you, you, you're not going to, let, let's follow, follow me. You'll, you'll see my point. Let's go down to verse number 10. So these servants went out into the highways and gathered together as many. Do you have many? Does this church have many, Lima? We need many. I mean, we need many, not few. We need many. Uh-oh. Let's, go, let's keep going. Go down to verse number 14. For as many, for many are called. How many? Many. I think many is more than two, don't you? You know who understands verse 14? Let me tell you who understands verse 14. Walmart. Hallmark. Midas. They understand verse 14. You know what they understand? If we don't get many, we go bankrupt. We need many. You know who understands verse 14? Navy recruiters. You know, where, where's, the, where's the Navy recruiter shop usually put? Where, where's the Navy usually put their recruiting? Where is it? Why? Many. Where's the Army put the recruit? Many. They're going to put it somewhere where people are everywhere. Why? Because they understand the concept. You got to have many. I don't know why we've missed this. Now, look at, look at verse 14. Close. This is a deep verse. Don't just glance over it. For as many as are called, we got to call them. we got to call many. we got to get out there and call them. we got to go to them. Build it, and they will come doesn't work. They're not coming. They're not coming, are they? Lima, are they here yet? They're not coming, are they? So that's a, just having a church building, and that's the evangelism strategy of most of our congregation. Well, we got a building, a nice one. We keep it nice and low. They're not coming. For as many as are called. Now, when you call them, they might come. You, but how many do you have to call? One, two, how many have to be called? Oh, many. And we can do that, by the way. For as many as are called. Then now, look at this. Few are chosen. Now, um, I'm going to expand on this Sunday. But let me, let me, let me take this first. And um, uh, God forbid. But if you allow me, I'm going to change the verse. I'm going to make the verse reflective of our churches. Watch this. Few are called, none are chosen. That's where we are. We call few and we get almost nothing. We call one or two people. You know, How many contacts you got on your list? Most don't have a list. If they have it, well, I got one or two people we're working with right now. Guess how many? How many are going to be chosen from one or two? Maybe none. So how many you got to call? Many. You're going to have to call many because, because that's what Jesus said. Many are called. We're going to get out there. How do you call it with the gospel? You're going to get out there and call more. Now, I'm going to talk more about that later. Let me tell you about how to call. Let me talk about how do we call people. All right. Is it possible that there are people who live in this community that, Lima, and I'm going to ask you this question. I love Lima. Lima is a soul winner. Um, if you guys don't know Lima, you need to meet him. He's an amazing preacher. And he gets it. Um, so I'm not picking on him. I just want you to know that. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask some tough questions. Lima, in this community, around this church building, I need to know tonight, how many people do you think, do you think there are people, 
immediately surrounding this church building that don't know the Honolulu Church of Christ is here. Do you think that's right? I bet it is. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing that we can actually have a church building and people don't even know we're here. Well, what is that? I don't know. Some, I don't know. Some think they may be religious. They sing songs. I hear them through the windows. How do we let the community know we're here? We better get it out there. We better get it out there somehow. Somehow we better let them know we're here. Because they're not coming if they don't know you're here. Do you think it's important for Midas to advertise? Do you think it's important for Hallmark to advertise? Do you think it's important for whatever it is that you do? If maybe you have a little business, do you ever have a card printed and you send it out? Uh, I don't know if you've realized it or not, but you move, Lowe's knows where you're at. They advertise. You're the first piece of literature you get is from, do you all have Lowe's and Honolulu? Oh, good, good. So the first thing you're going to get when you move is a postcard from Lowe's. They, they, they advertising. And you, you go to the media, you go... You get things in the mail because they want you to know where they're at. Do you advertise? Do you promote this church? Do, they, do people even know you're here? When a house to house, when Alan Webster called me four years ago, four and a half years ago to the date, he said, hey, Rob, he says, uh, I want you to come start a school of evangelism. I said, no, you don't. <laughs> but I'm perfectly happy and relaxed. Um, Rob, we need, to, we need to train churches, and uh, I know you've got something that works, and uh, I'll tell you what, uh, I'll throw our entire effort behind what you're going to do if you'll do it. So I went down, and I talked to the elders and Alan, and, uh, and I had a question, because I don't want to be used. And this was my question. Alan, if I come and I start this school of evangelism under the umbrella of house to house, I got a question for you. Do I have to promote the magazine? His answer will determine whether or not I say yes. He said, nope, you don't have to mention it. I said, okay, you got a deal. I'm not here to sell a magazine. So I want to make that very clear to the audience tonight. There's only one reason I mention house to house, heart to heart. Because it works. That's why. I have used this for 20 years, and it works. When you do it right. Now, I thought everybody knew how to do it. I mean, I literally thought everyone knew how to use house to so I remember one of the first churches I went to, East Side, Cleveland, Tennessee, Jeff Archie. So I, I would call me, I go to the elders meeting, got a big board room, and it was intimidating. I meet with more elders and probably any preacher in the brotherhood. I do it 52 times I did it last year. I sit in rooms and I have elders and like a board meeting. And this, this eldership is pretty large eldership. And, uh, and I, so I started point number one. I said, brethren, you got to promote your church, house to house. Heart. Rob, that doesn't work. Brethren, I didn't have a response. I mean, I didn't think that would ever be heard. I thought I'd never hear that come out of a Christian's mouth because it's one of the most effective tools I've ever, ever come across. I mean, it, it, there's nothing else out there like it. And I said, well, I said, I don't understand. Well, it doesn't work. Yeah, we tried that. And I said, well, well so I, I, I'm trying to think on my feet. And I said, brethren, uh, tell me how you tried it. And they said, well, we tried it in this area once, didn't get a response. And we moved it to this area. Then we tried it twice last year. It doesn't work like that. It's not going to work if you do that. So there's a process you got to follow with house to house if it's going to work. Now, I'm looking forward to meeting again on Sunday because I've already examined your house to house, heart to heart. Now, we've got to work on it a little bit. Because there are some things, if you do it right, if there are some things on this magazine, if you do it right, you're going to get people. But if you don't do it right, in the right way, it will not work. You're throwing money away. So one of the things we do when we come to a church is we fix that problem. And I can't wait. I'm looking forward to that. So this, this is a way to advertise your church, your, your congregation, to people all around this area so they know you're actually here. Now, what happens when you do that? Every year since I've been at Jacksonville, we baptize four or five people because of it. We did it at Willette. But we know how to use it. One of the things we put on the publication, on the very front of it, all right, you, you, there's information you can put on it is you got to actually identify where you're located. You know, I went to a church recently. I said, can I see your house to house? Heart? There's no address on it. There's not an address on it. I said, brethren, where are they going to go? Oh, well, um, we got to fix that. How long have you been doing it like that? Oh, several years. So, so, so let's, let's talk about Perry and Ellen. Let me talk about them. Um, so I'm, I'm, I've got back from a seminar. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I've been gone three weeks. Nicole goes and visits, visits her mom and dad, Jared, and Hannah went with her. One of the few times that we're actually separated, and I'm sitting in the pew, and I'm 
visitor. <laughs> I love visitors, Ren. When I find a visitor, man, they got a target on their back. So I'm, I'm, I think that's it. So Alan finishes his sermon. And I follow Alan down the pew. So we follow down the, down the aisle. Alan, who is that right there? Uh, Rob, I think that's a visitor. Yes. I said, so I snuck in behind her. She's a cat. I snuck right in behind her. She won't escape. So I get right in behind her, closing prayer. She turns around there, right? Uh, hello, my name is Rob. And what is your name? My name's uh, uh, Ellen. I said, Helen, nice to meet you. I said, um, are, are you visiting this morning? Sure am. I said, well, well nice to have you. I said, Ellen, do you live in our community? Sure do, just down the road. I said, well, that's wonderful. Ellen, are you alone this morning? Well, my husband was coming with me, but we turned around. He got sick, but I needed to go to church. I said, well, I'm glad you're here. I'm sorry about your husband. And, and uh, Ellen, uh, can I ask you a question? Well, sure. Did you like the sermon this morning? Yes. I said, what'd you like about it? He liked that man, loves the Bible. I said, yeah, he, he loves the Bible. Lots of scripture. I said, he loves the scripture. And um, I, I said, well, man, I sure would like to meet your husband. You know, my wife is visiting her mom this morning. And I said, I wish I could. She said, well, you know what? I want my husband to meet your mom. Hey, do you guys have an evening service? Glad we weren't closed. Yes, we do. I said, yes, ma'am, six o'clock. We'll be, we'll be sure we'll be, we'll be right here. And, um, and uh, she, I said, well, why don't, well, she said, well, I'm going to bring my husband tonight. If he fit. I said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll make sure my wife is here. I had to call Nicole and have an uncomfortable conversation. Honey, I know you want to see mama, but I need you. And uh, she knows. I said, I need you home. And she said, oh, I'm coming. So she got home that night and we, she pulls in and we sit, sit in there. There she comes. She brings her husband, Perry. Perry sits down. Ellen and Perry and I are sitting in the pew. And um, Nicole and I walked over, talked to him. And we're just converse, com, conversational. Nothing, not, nothing too deep. Um, and, um, hey, Perry. And I, here's my one-liner. We just so happen to have this custom. Write it down. It works. Um, we always take visitors out to eat. What's your favorite restaurant? Rob, it's kind of expensive. It's a Phoenix. No problem. And I said, we've got that covered. I'll talk about that later. And I said, we're, we're going to go to a Phoenix. He said, oh, man, that's great. Rob, my stomach's not feeling. If I'm going to a Phoenix, I want to eat. And I said, I get it. Can I take a rain check? I mean, I really want to go. I said, okay. When you want to go? How about next Sunday? I said, sounds good. Just so happened we were going to be back next Sunday. So we got back next. They walk in the church building, and we go to a Phoenix. Brethren, I got to a Phoenix, Italian. I could care less about the lasagna. I have one mission, and I'll get there. I am very focused when I'm with sinners. So I sat down on the table. We're sitting around the room, right? We're just talking. We're visiting, and I got I to gotta find his sweet spot. This, this is easy stuff. Perry, uh, what do you like to do? You like baseball? Too slow. Me too. Uh, Perry, like NFL football? <laughs> not anymore. Man, I don't. I said, me too, Perry. Not, not anymore. And um, I said, Perry, uh, what do you like? He said, he said, college football. I said, oh, no, here it comes. Go, Alabama. I said, oh, no. Go, Alabama. I said, all right, Perry, go out. I said, what about Nick Saban? Good coach. You know, I can find something nice to say about Alabama. Go, get, go Nick Saban. And uh, so we're talking about Alabama football, and he's, more, he's, he's in the car. Hey, Perry, do you know what? Tomorrow is a championship game, and guess what we're having at our house? We're having a championship party. Ouch, what was that? That was my wife kicking me in the heel. She's good at this. And she, we're not having it. Yes, we are. And uh, I said, Perry, you're invited. And I said, wait, we're wondering. I said, my wife is going to make those little weenie, what's it called, pigs in the blanket, mustard on top. And she's going to make the sausage. Y'all make sausage balls in Honolulu, uh, Brow sausage balls. They're very good. And uh, we, we're going to put them all together, put it on a plate. She, she said, well, I'm coming over, you know. So they come over to my house. I have one missing. I could care less about the football game. I have one thing I want. I'm going to get it. They walk in my house. We serve the food. We're watching the game. It's a blowout. Halftime comes, and I, I mute it. Hey, Perry, can we talk a minute? Sure. I got, I got a question. This is just, I just can't seem to find an answer to this. Perry, there are like 20 churches in Jacksonville. What are the odds you just show up at the Jacksonville Church of Christ? Oh, 21 years ago, Rob, we got that publication called House to House, Heart to Heart, and we decided, you know, our church isn't following the Bible anymore, and we need to go to a church. And Ellen said, well, Rob, that, Perry, that church follows the Bible. They talk about it every time the magazine comes out. We get it every month. Hey, Perry, uh, would you happen to want to know more about our church? Sure, I don't know anything about your church. I just so happen to have these little booklets. I always have the booklets because I have one mission. And three weeks later, I will baptize them. It happens nine times out of ten. It's not because of me. Brethren, when you plant the seed, God is powerful. 
Here's a, here's a fertile field. Guess what happens when you put God's word in fertile fields? It produces almost every single time if you have an organized approach and you're not shooting from the hip. Now, we're going to promote events on the back. you got to promote the right events. By the way, they're not coming because you're having Glenn Colley. I love Glenn Colley. He's my friend, but that's not going to get the center out here to come. They don't know who Glenn Colley is. But there are things you can put back there that they will come. I'll tell you what those are later. You're going to advertise things in the middle of it like, hey, send me, a, send, send me this reply back with your information. We'll send you a poster board, a, you know, a poster of the Ten Commandments. Or pick, pick what you want and we'll send it. Oh, but they do. And um, I got a phone call again from Deb Rice. Deb Rice said, hey, Rob, I got one of these house-to-house uh, -house things back. Now, Rob, the elder said we're doing it different now. I said, yes. Rob, we're not supposed to mail them this stuff anymore. I said, oh, no, we don't mail things. Well, what am I supposed to do with this request? They want marriage material. I said, well, I put the uh, material in my box and I'll deliver it in person. She said, okay. So Nicole and I went down to the box when we got home and uh, the, uh, we're looking for Brenda Flay. We went all over. She doesn't know how to write an address. We finally found Brenda Flay. And uh, yeah. always take a woman. Men, always take a woman. Do not go alone. Always take a woman or a child. So I take my, I, my wife saying there, yes, can I help you? I said, yes, ma'am. My name is Rob. My wife, Nicole, we're from house to house, heart to heart. You asked for some marriage. Material. Oh, yes, I did. And, oh, ma'am, we're hand delivering it. Oh, but that's so nice. And, well, that's so, I didn't need that. I said, well, ma'am, have you recently gotten married? Yes, I did. I just had. And about a month ago. And, well, how long have you lived here? Oh, we've lived here about, sir, why didn't you just mail it? Hmm. Well, I could have met you if I mailed it. Oh, that's true. That's true. So how long have you lived here? Oh, about a month. And how, how do you like Jacksonville? Well, I don't know much about the area. Sir, wait a minute, sir. Can I ask you a question? I said, sure. Sir, we don't have a church to attend. Oh, really? Um, do you know anything about the Bible? Oh, just a little bit. Good, because my husband knows nothing about the Bible. Daniel, get off the couch. That man has been on the couch ever since he came home. I don't know what he does all day. Daniel, get up off the couch. There are visitors here for you. And so she grabbed her husband. And came, oh, but Daniel comes. And then Dan, Daniel, this couple here and me are going to teach you the Bible. You could have blown me over. I said, when would you like to begin? She said, what about tomorrow? I said, my wife will have hot chocolate chip cookies waiting for you. We always eat. We always eat when we do study. From that one knock on the door, we baptized seven people. Without house to house, we baptized none of them. You never hit a target you don't aim for. Who are you aiming for? Oh, we're just aiming for this community. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. I want specific people. I want names. I want, I want to send house to house to specific people. In our, we're going to map it out, zone it out. We're going to get it to specific people, and we're going to follow up with them. It's potent. And we're going to teach you how to do some door knocking. I've learned something the last couple of years. I've learned that the traditional door knocking does not work. It's low result, low yield. So we've, we experimented at the school, and we tried different things. And we have now raised our success rate in door knocking to 33%. I'm going to give you one of the things we're doing that gives us a 33% success rate. I'm just going to give you one, all right? So I was talking to a, a friend of mine, um, David. Um, David preached at Mount Juliet. I was at Willad, and David's an evangelist. David likes to evangelize. And I, David and I would have conversations. I was actually driving down to take him on a flight. I'm a pilot, and sometimes I go flying, and David wanted to go flying. The weather was bad, so we take him flying. So, so we stopped, and I said, David, I, I need to ask you some questions. And uh, about evangelism, and uh, so we started talking and uh, about door knocking. He said, Rob, I think our door knocking strategy stinks. I said, what do you mean? He says, our goal post is way too far down the field. Most of us can't throw that far. Explain yourself. So I'm all ears. He said, I think when we show up at the door and expect to do a Bible study, that's unrealistic. And you're right. He said, I think when we show up at the door and expect to baptize them, that's unrealistic. I think when we show up at the door and invite them to church and think they're coming, that's unrealistic. And I think he's right on all three of those. How many of you have gone door knocking and you've knocked 100 doors? And how many of you organized a group of people at your church to knock doors? And you've knocked doors on maybe 500 houses, and then Sunday morning, everybody's doing this. You know what they're looking for, don't you? Just one person to show up, and no one comes. And what does that do to the morale of your church? It destroys us. And how many people are going door knocking tomorrow? Nobody. 
except a preacher because you're paid to do it. So, so we got to come up with something different. And I said, David, you're right. So let me tell you what we've done. American Mission Campaign, uh, we've, we've started experimenting. And um, here's something that gives you a 33% rate of return. And we moved the goalpost, by the way. See, our success is not Bible study, go to church. Our success is called contact. When I get a name, address, phone number, and they ask me to come back, that's success. And I am coming back. Man, my name is Rob. My wife is Nicole. We're Christians in your local community. Um, we know things have been difficult in our country the last uh, last year or two, and uh, we, we want to help. Um, or can we pray for you? Do you know anybody in your life that needs prayer? Do you know a daughter, son, a grandmother, a dad, mom? Yeah, my, my mother's back there, and she's got first stages of dementia, and, 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 and could you pray for my mother? Sure, what's your, what's your name? Get your contact card, honey. Um, yes, and, and, and ma'am, could, do you, can we pray? For, oh, yes, you can. And what is your name again? Kathy Owens and 136 uh, you know, D Street. Yes, ma'am. And, and, and let's pray. We pray. Ma'am, could, 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 I, could I leave you some literature and come back and maybe pray again? You, sir, you can come back any time. Success, 33%. 33% of the time I do that, I get success. I just gave you one bullet. I got four more. I got four bullets. I just gave you one. I got three more to give you. I don't have time. Let's go to the next one. That's called new movers. So one of the great blessings of house to house is that we have access to every person who moves into your community. Brother Wren, in your surrounding area, how many people do you think move in every month? Just right around your building. Every month. Just in a month, 30 days, how many new people are going to move right here? How many? Three? Okay, it's good. Good number. Brother Ralph, give me a, give me a number. Any number. How many people you think move right around your building right here? Uh, we're looking at your immediate mailing area. Your immediate mail. I don't know what your mailing area is right here. Uh, yes, this zip code, Honolulu. Yes, this zip code. Okay, 20. All right. Brother Pat, where are you at? Where's Brother Pat at? He's one of the other. Oh, Brother Pat, how many... Uh, how many people do you think move in your surrounding area here per month, every month? Yeah, just, just in your this zip code, right here in this zip code. Anybody, anybody can guess. I just, I'm not meaning to pick on your elders. I'm just trying to engage the audience. That's all I'm doing. I, just want, to, I, I want you guys to be interactive with me. Anybody want to take another guess? That's, two, yeah, not, not 300. Yeah, yeah. Okay, 47 people every month. You have 47 people who move right around here every month. Now, here's what we can do. I can give you their name, address, and I can give you a, a, an app, and I can locate them for you. I can show you exactly where they live. Now, what if we trained our ladies, and my wife is training your ladies right now. See, my wife went to Walmart right before, didn't we, Lima? We were at Walmart. You know why we were at Walmart? Because my wife was going shopping in the name of the Lord. She is going to go shopping with one purpose, and that is to form a new mover's basket. And our ladies love to shop, so let them. Do not ask Bernice to do it. Ask the widows to do it. Ask the ladies to do it. And get your women involved. My wife is training your ladies right now how to go shopping in the name of the Lord. They're excited. They're ready to go. They're going to build 10, 15, 20 of these baskets. And guess what we're going to do? We're going to knock on the door of every – now, we may not go over to the college. It's not because I don't want to save college folks, but that's a tough area to go. Transient. And I'm looking for residential areas. So I'm going to blow up the mat. Now, Brother Ralph, I don't know where that's at, but you would. You've lived here a long time. You're going to blow Ah, hey, they, they just live across the street from me. They live down the road. Oh, that's it. We're going to knock on the door and say, my name is Wren. This is my wife. What's your wife's name? What is it? Rose. My wife, Rose. And we've lived here for how long? 16 years. We'd like to welcome you to the community. You think you might get a smile? You think somebody might say, Wow, that was really nice. And, oh, by the way, we, our ladies at church made you a basket for uh, of things. And uh, you probably have a lay in it, too. And I love my lay. And, um, and so what, what's going to happen when, that, when you do that? Well, you're going to make contact with people. See, your job is to many are called. How do you call many? Oh, you got to call them. you got to call You door knock. You use house to house, heart to heart. You use new, oh, I've got six ways from Sunday to teach you how to do this. And we're going to do them all. We're going to make a massive contact group. And we're going to go after them. 
So we're going to use new movers. David Shannon said people are most likely to change churches when they move. He said this at Polishing the Pulpit 2014. He said a couple of generations ago, if a couple or a family or an individual moved from one city to another city, they usually stayed at that same denomination. Those days are over. It doesn't matter to me what denomination they were in in the last town. Your average person today is willing to look at any church in their neighborhood. That is a powerful opportunity for evangelism. It doesn't matter to me what church they were attending in the last town. I want them to visit the church of Christ because it's going to give us the best opportunity to sit down with them and study the word of God. Contact. You have to have contact or you have nothing. Walmart has no customers to go bankrupt. A church has no people. They shut their doors. Brethren, you need people. This is powerful. It's called compassion cards. And take your Bibles, go to Jude. Everybody go to Jude. I want to show you it's biblical. Let's go to Jude. Let's let Jude teach us something tonight. This is the book of Jude. So we're going to um, let Jude teach us something about people. And uh, Jude is that one-page book right before Revelation. And uh, you can miss it if you blink. There it is. Jude, verse 22. And Lima, what does it say there? Read it loud for me. All right. Stop. On some have what? You know how some people will be saved with what? Compassion. So we've got we've to be compassionate to people. Now, some people you save with fear. That's verse 23. That's another, another lesson. But a lot of people just need compassion. So what we're going to do is take our contact, like the people who gave us a smile when we knocked on the door with new movers or when we were knocking on the door, they said, thank you for, you know, please, please, please pray for my mama. She's got dementia. Or, or maybe someone who showed up because of house to house or, or a visitor that came or, or, or maybe you know somebody who's sick and we're going to put them on our congregational list and we're going to send, no, not one card with 20 signatures. There's always a cheapskate among us. It doesn't work. There's always somebody who says, well, we can save a lot of money and put one 20, all 20 of us can sign this one card. Don't listen to this person. They don't know what they're doing. I through experience, I know what works. What works is you send that, if you got 20 people writing cards, they get 20 cards. Now, now it's got to be strategic. There's a process you got to follow. And we'll give you the, we'll give you the material, but here's what it looks like. Five cards on Monday, five cards on Tuesday, five cards on Wednesday. And, and Bernice has an Excel spreadsheet, and we'll give you the spreadsheet. We don't want you to waste your time developing things. We're going to give you everything. Five cards on Thursday, five cards on Friday, and this person is going to go to their mailbox and get these cards every single day, and they're going to get that for four weeks. And then Lima and his beautiful bride is going to go to that house. Hello, my name is Lima. This is my wife, and uh, my church over here at Honolulu, I tend, we've been sending you some cards. We understand you've had cancer. You've been sending those cards. Sir, come in, and they'll pull you in the house. Don't believe me? It happens. They will pull you in the house. Sir, i got to show you these cards. We have got 63 cards from your church in the last four weeks. I've never seen a church like this. Would you like to know more about our church? I, sure, I just so happen to have these little booklets. <laughs> We're always prepared, aren't we? Because we have one mission. The mission is not to send cards. Most churches have some card mission that sends to elders, preachers, and members who are sick. Brother, Brother Ren, have you ever got a card from this church when you were sick? Yes, yes. My, my, I get cards. I, I'm going to ask you another question. Let's say you got sick, but you didn't get any cards. Would you still come? I, I know you would. Brother, I'm, I, I think you should send cards to Brother Ren if he gets sick. I'm all for it. But Brother Ren is going to come regardless if he gets a card or not. All right? He's not. Do you know who needs cards? Sinners need cards. They need compassion. They need to see that this church cares about them. And when they get 67 cards and Lima and his wife show up and knock the door, let me tell you what's just happened. The soil's been tilled. All he's got to do is plant the seed. Now, listen to this one-liner. When you do your job, I'll do mine. You know, the preacher has a hard time doing his job when the members aren't doing theirs. We need you active. We need you working. We need it organized. We need you out there helping. Because when a church helps their preacher, oh, the preacher loves it. But the preacher can't do it by himself. But you can send a call. You say, well, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know how to. I, I can't lead a Bible study. That's okay. Can you send a call? You know, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you don't get COVID from sending cards. 
if I'm not mistaken, Dr. Fauci has not eliminated card sending yet. We can all send cards safely. We can fill them out, put them in, and we're going to do it strategically. Guess what happens when that, when you do this, guess what happens? Her name is Bettina. All the conversions I'm talking about are conversions we've had recently at Jacksonville. Because I want this to be up to date. I want you to realize that I practice what I preach. I'm not a walking theory. And brethren, here's her name is Bettina. See all that? Every Look at this right here. Uh, this doesn't work. All right. These are called what? And what's that called right there? These are cards. Guess who sent them? Jacksonville. I didn't do it. You know, when Jacksonville does her job, when I get home, I'll do mine. I can show up at Bettina's house. And she said, look at all these cards, Rob. I said, yes, <laughs> Bettina. I said, I got a lot. Never had this many cards before. And, uh, and uh, we spent a couple weeks prospecting Bettina. We got her a new chair. That chair she's sitting in, isn't that the chair we picked up, Jared? We got that at Big Lots. He didn't have one. And, um, and um, it's amazing what happens when you actually use benevolence with a purpose. All right, so we've helped Benina. In fact, Jared and Hannah went over and cleaned her apartment one day. It was dirty. Uh, she couldn't clean it. She was on oxygen, so we cleaned it for her. And I'm sitting there in, in, with her, my one-liner. Here it is. You know what I'm going to say, don't you? Bettina, what do you think about the Jacksonville Church of Christ? Nicest church I've ever attended. I, this, you are wonderful people. Bettina, would you like to know more about us? Sure. I just so happen to have these little booklets. I do the same thing every time. This is not rocket science. People are not that complicated. Love them. Show them you care about them. It's amazing what they want to They want to know why you like that. Well, let me show you why. Because Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 32, you can know the truth and it will set you free. And we're going to do a study. It works, brethren. This stuff works. I, man, my time is, I tell you what, my time's going. Uh, I wish I could tell you about this Bible study. It was a unique Bible. In fact, I'm just going to do it. So we're in the third booklet, Mark 16, 16. We're about to read it. Bettina reads it. I want you to, have you ever heard Mark's, this version? Brad, tell me if you've heard this version before. I've never heard this version. Oh, Rob, my pastor taught me all about this verse. Yes, he that believes is saved and then baptized. Have you heard that version before? I have never heard that version. Have you, Brother Meacham? I, I've never heard that version. I didn't even know that version existed. And I said, uh, Bettina, would you read that verse for me again? She said, oh, yeah, my, Rob, my, my pastor told me about he that believes is saved and baptized. I didn't know that verse. I said, Bettina, are, are, can you read it like one word at a time? Rob, um, am I doing something wrong? I said, well, just read it one word at a time. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. That's not what my pastor told me it said. I, I bet not. He that believes and is baptized. Guess what she Guess what happened to Bettina? That's exactly right, Zach. That's exactly right. That's what happens when you do Bible study. Now, the best part of the, not the, the worst part of this happened right afterwards. So Bettina's drying off. Bettina, for some reason, I had a suspicion that you had a connection with the Church of Christ at some time in your life. Well, yes, my last town I lived in. Oh, she said, I went to the Ohatchee Church of Christ. Wow. Well, now, Rob, I was Baptist. I said, oh, okay, all right. But I decided to go to Ohatchee. I said, okay. I said, Bettina, I guess you didn't go there long. Oh, yes, yes. Went there every Sunday. Every Sunday? Uh, Bettina, um, you probably didn't live there very long. How many, how long do you, oh, 10 years. 10 years every Sunday. Now, now I'm, I'm getting concerned. Uh, Bettina, in the 10 years you went to that church and sat in their pew, did one member of that church, just one, did the preacher, did an elder, did anybody offer to do a Bible study? No, nope, never done one. You want to know why we're dying? That's why. Because they sit in our pews and we do nothing to reach them. Six months later, I'm heading back from Texas. I get a phone call from Rebecca Pearson. Hello? Rob, uh, this is Rebecca. Rob, I've been over here taking care of Bettina. Rob, she's not responding. Um, Bettina, uh, uh, Rebecca, um, what do you mean? Rob, I shook her. Uh, Rebecca, what's going on? Rebe Rob, she's not responding. Uh, Rebecca, call 911. I already did. She didn't make it. Aren't you glad she wasn't going to Ohatchee? Because she would be lost. You got to learn how to treat visitors. This is a big one. 
Y'all have y'all y'all happen to have a lot of visitors that come to Honolulu. So we're gonna have to work on this. Because you're gonna have to come up with a way to differentiate between the visitors who actually live in Honolulu and the, the people who come from Alabama and Indiana. And I don't mean to be disrespectful, but we're not looking for you guys. All right. We're looking for the people that come and live in Honolulu. Now, I've, we've got thank, my, my wife right now is teaching her ladies how to go shopping in the name of the Lord. Men, all your ladies are going to want to go shopping when my wife is done. I'm just sorry it's going to happen. Now, but we're going to shop with a purpose. We're going to create visitor bags. Those visitor bags are designed for one purpose. And is a visitor a contact? This is a trick question. Nope. They're not. Trick question. Visitors are not contacts. You know why? Why aren't they contacts, Lima? You know why? Okay. You're on the right track. A visitor is not a contact until you get name, address, and phone number. It's a wasted opportunity if you don't get that. How do I get name, address, and phone number? Visitor bag. I hand it to them. My name is Rob. What's your name, sir? And I'm going to, Ren. Oh, Ren, beautiful family. Are you visiting this morning? Yes. Do you live here in the Honolulu? Yes. Ren, I've got something I want to give you. I'm going to give him a visitor bag. And, I, and, and it's going to have a lay in it and all this. And, and I'm trained how to do this because the elders are going to train about six families here how to do this, maybe more. And, um, so we're going to give that to you. Oh, by the way, we are card sending church. Can I get your name and phone number and address so we can send cards? They will give me that information every single time. So Keith Ritchie, uh, this is, he's good at it. Keith has gone through our school twice. He's our preacher. When a visitor walks in the door, Keith does the same thing every time. The members give the visitor bag out, get the contact, give it to Keith. Keith uses his one-liner. Hey, we have a custom here at this church. We always take visitors out to eat. Would you like to go out to eat? Who's going to say no when a hamburger costs $10? We're going to feed their whole family. Of course they're going to say yes. By the way, you know it's not unscriptural for the church to reimburse the preacher when they take visitors out to eat. If you can buy scissors and glue, you can help the preacher take visitors out to eat. And so, yes, we're going to take him out. Guess what happened? That's Cameron and Lindsay. I wish I had to tell you. Baptized. We're going to take people out to eat. You always eat. Always take people out to eat. Or take them to a home and eat. Eating's important. You'll get Bible studies. I wish, I, I'm running out of time. All right, that's, the, uh, that's in your Evangelism Simplified Guidebook. And uh, let's notice the chart. Everybody look at that. Purpo What's the purpose of the church? What is it, everybody? What is the purpose of the church? To make known to the world the what? The manifold wisdom of God. That's the purpose of the church. So we're going to make that the purpose of the church in everything we do. So it's going to be the purpose of the church with everybody that sits in the pew. It's going to be the purpose of the church in our card writing. We're actually going to not write cards to members, but sinners we're not going to write cards to we're going to write lots of cards we're going to we're going to work on visitors door knocking house to house heart to heart new movers digital media benevolent and there's a lot more but guess what happens when you do that you baptize 10 15 20 people in a year not because of a gimmick that's called the gospel brother in action that's love in action that's Christianity working. That's when a congregation does her job. I don't have time to go through. This is, huh, this is what I call the Larry Acuff special. Powerful, powerful. This is, I don't have time. I'm out of time. So when you do that, oh, 17, 18 baptisms in 12 months from a congregation of 100 people. Call Chris Broda, Mount Pleasant, Texas, asking, asking about it. And we teach churches how to do that right there. That's members. Those are members. And you're about to learn how to do it at Honolulu. we got to get everybody involved. For the body is not one member but many. Everybody's got to be involved. No one's exempt. Widows and widowers, I don't care who you are, everybody's involved. Number eight, we're going to make evangelism the priority of the church. It becomes the number one thing we do. It's more important than any other activity we do in this church. Number nine, we're going to publicize our mission from the pulpit. We're not going to hide it in an elder's office. We're going to let everybody know what we're doing. We're going to give them a plan, a job. We're going to preach and teach and train. Number 10, and lastly, we're going to pray for souls to be saved. Thank you for being here tonight. As always, I've, I've gone over my allotted time. But Brother Wren, if you want to fire me when I'm finished, that's okay. I hope not. Thank you for allowing us to be here. You have extended hospitality in a great way to my family. I can truly say of this church, we have never been treated with greater kindness than you have. We look forward to being with you on Sunday.
we have, we have more training to do. And uh, we're going to make that plan operational, and it will be exciting. God bless you. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for the uh, time we spent together tonight. Bless us, Father, that we might be like Jesus. Help us to seek and save the lost. We pray for the elders of this church. Bless them, Father, with wisdom and courage. We thank thee for these men who've taken the responsibility of the highest office in the land, to shepherd, to feed, and to lead. Bless Lima as he preaches from the pulpit. Bless every member. Give these men in this audience the courage to fight the good fight of faith and to lay hold on eternal life. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Be dismissed.